Hi everyone and welcome to today's Goat Roadshow webinar on supplementation. I'm Melanie Smith, I'm the Project Manager for Sheep and Goats at Meat and Livestock Australia and I'll be doing the introductions and a bit of housekeeping this morning. And we've got three great speakers lined up for you today to have a bit of an insight into all aspects of supplementation. So first of all, we might just start off with a little bit of housekeeping before we get going and apologies for my camera not working the best. I might just stop my video, but I'll still be here presenting to you. So can everyone please make sure that your microphones are on mute and that your cameras are off. This will just help with us having a little bit more bandwidth to make sure that the webinar runs smoothly. This session is currently recorded and will be distributed to MLA for those that aren't able to make the, the webinar today. But if you want to touch on more information or you feel like you've missed anything from the webinar, you'll be able to view the recording on the MLA website. We do ask that if you have questions to any of the speakers, please use the question and answer function, which is located at the top of the screen rather than in the chat. This will allow you to have your questions adequately answered. If the webinar is disconnected, we will issue you with a new link within 10 minutes. So hopefully we don't have that problem, but if it is, we'll make sure that we reach out to you in a short period of time. Just wanted to, to quickly start on a little bit about the, the GOAT MLA program. Um, and to give you an insight and update into where the goat market is at at the moment, as well as our research and development. To start off, a little bit about MLA. MLA is a service provider to the industry, and we're not um, an industry representative body or a lobby group. What we are is a, is a provider that uh, conducts research, development, and adoption to increase on-farm goat productivity. We also conduct marketing activities to grow the demand for goat meat, both domestically and internationally. In terms of industry structure, MLA is the service provider to the red meat industry. The peak industry councils guide MLA and other industry priorities. GAICA, the Goat Industry Council of Australia, is the goat industry um, representative which guides MLA. GAICA is not only the peak council, but it develops collective goat industry policies across all different types of goat breeds. It works with government, industry bodies and producers and other peak industry councils as well. Underneath GAICA, we have GERDAC, which is the Goat Industry Research, Development and Adoption Committee. GERDAC is an advisory group comprised predominantly of producers. And this is really important because they bring forward the issues confronting the industry. They also provide technical support and assistance for GAIPA and MLA. They provide recommendations on research, development and adoption initiatives and are administered by MLA. So I encourage all of you, if you haven't had a chance to meet your GERDAC and GAIPA representatives, to please get engaged with them and reach out. In terms of what MLA does for research, development and adoption, we invest in both levy funded and MLA donor company research and development projects for goats and within a ride, with a wide range of partners, including producer groups and research organizations. We work closely with GAICA to, pour, to form project conceptions and development through to the selection of research organizations to actually conduct that research. Together, MLA and GAICA host annual producer forums in each member state to seek input on levy investments. So please, I encourage you again to get involved. In talking about our investments, in 2021 and 2022, you can see on the screen there's a nice breakdown of where those uh, levy funds went. It's a small amount of money but it's strategically invested to try and get the most out of the whole um, levies that we have. So point one went into our people, into our customers, our consumers and our communities, but majority of it actually went into our livestock with an investment of 0.2 million. 
So it's a small amount, but we're definitely strategic in how we're using it to try and get the most out of the MD uh, research and development dollars. In terms of market insights, it's a really promising and opportunistic time to be involved within the goat industry. We can see that Australian goat production is rebounded after several years of adverse environmental conditions impacting supply volumes. And 2021 saw the first increase in, in number of head actually slaughtered, as well as a strong increase in carcass weights. These sustainable favorable conditions since 2020 have triggered the expansion of not only the flock size, but also the overall conditions of the, the, the goats being pro produced in that 2021 year, and that's forecasted to continue into 2022. In terms of our goat meat utilisation and exports, goat meat in Australia is a bit of a niche market, but it's very popular with particular ethnic groups such as Ind Indian, Nepalese and Caribbean people. Australia is a net exporter of goat meat and in 2020, about 92% of production was actually exported. So that's only 8% being consumed domestically. Of the meat that we are exporting, majority of that is going into the US as well as Taiwan and the Korean market, which is emerging late of late um, with continued growth expected to increase over the forecasted future. So really exciting time to be involved within the goat industry and we can see that strong growth continuing to expand. Australia continues to be one of the largest goat exporters but we're also really well known for the quality of goat meat that we export into a lot of these export international markets, which is really great. In terms of the research, recent projects that we've been doing, there's two projects that I'd really just like to touch on today to give you a bit of an overview of what's going on within the goat industry. The first one is a new project which has recently been launched with MLA. It's improving goat reproductive performance and reducing kid loss. This is in conjunction with the University of Queensland, and it's looking at goat reproduction efficiency as it's a major impediment for the growth of the meat goat industry. There's currently limited information on the reproductive benchmarks for different production system and the causes of kid losses. So this project, which is commencing this year, is actually going to quantify goat reproductive performance across five different seasons and in different goat production systems. They're going to evaluate the drivers for this variation to further understand what the causes are and also to demonstrate improvements through management interventions. The next project I wanted to quickly touch on is a current kid plan survey, which is actively out at the moment. This project aims to evaluate the understanding and the impediments to the use of kid plan amongst breeders and producers of goats in Australia. The online survey is now open and will be available in the chat function to everyone viewing this MLA webinar. There are two surveys, first a commercial producer survey and a seed stock producer survey. The survey link can be found on the MLA website if you haven't seen it in the, um, in the chat function or it was also available in the last um, e-newsletter of Goats on the Move. I really encourage all producers, even if you don't know or don't use Kid Plan, or if you're an active user of Kid Plan, to please conduct the survey and fill out the responses. It would be great to know why you're using it or why you don't want to use it so that we can actually Im implement changes in the future. Producer Demonstration Sites Program is a great way for producers to get involved. I'm really proud to say that this year it's the first application and the first time we've been able to open the PDS to goat producers. If you're not familiar with the PDS program, it aims to increase the rate of adoption of key management practices and technologies that improve business profitability, productivity and sustainability. It's a really exciting opportunity for goat producers to get involved to showcase the on-farm benefits that can be applied across different types of goat production systems and in different regions. The PDS package pulls different regions and goat production systems together to demonstrate the on-farm benefits of research and development. You, a minimum of 10 core producers 
need to come together to be eligible for a PBS site. And they produce a steering committee, committee from which three or more hosting demonstration sites can be built on. So there's some flexibility, especially with those extensive regions, but it's a great way to be involved and to implement change and see how practices can be implemented on farm and how they apply for different types of production systems. A link to the PDS site, if you're not savvy with, with, um, with the MLA website, will be attached to the chat program, but please do look it up. It's currently open at the moment until the, 11th, to the 13th sorry, of May, and we'd love to see some goat producers come on board. For those that aren't familiar with the MLA resources, if you're a levy paying producer, then the MLA membership is free. I encourage all of you to apply. Um, if you're not a member already, it's a great way to get involved with the subscriptions, opportunities to attend the um, MLA general meetings, as well as just stay connected with a lot of things occurring within the, the red meat industry in general. So please do apply for your membership if you haven't already. We also have some great online resources. The Going Into Goat Guides has 12 online modules covering essential processes for a successful goat enterprise. It was developed for, by producers for producers and it's currently on the MLA website. We also have a newly released goat disease booklet, which has been really popular. It is available um, and it's downloadable and a PDF on the MLA website or you can contact MLA directly to ask for a hard copy if you'd like it to be posted out to you. It's a great resource and it's only recently been released this year. I'd also like to just inform you about the profitable grazing system, getting into goats to market as optimal rangeland production system. This PGS takes small groups of like-minded producers who want to improve their whole farm performance and match them with the delivering who builds their knowledge, on skills and experience through a hands-on training. It's a user pays program, but feel free to reach out to MLA if you would like to participate in this system. It's also great and we really want to engage with you, the producers, so please stay in touch. You can jump onto the MLA events and workshop um, website where you can find up-to-date information on the webinars, workshops and field days that we're running in different regions across Australia. It's great for you to keep up to date, but it's also great for us to stay in touch with you as well. So please do sign up today. And thank you as well for coming on today's webinar and I hope you get a lot out for it, out of it. I'd like to now take the opportunity to introduce our first speaker to you, Reza Tamozi. And I'm sorry, I'd probably pronounced that wrong, but he's a ruminant nutritionist with All Tech Line Art Australia. He's based in Roseworthy, South Australia, he got his PhD from the University of New England Armadale in 2008 and currently he is an experienced animal nutritionist working within the feed and feed additive industry. Reza will outline supplementary feeding to you as well as planning and management on how to supplement how supplementary feeding can benefit farmers and producers. So please welcome Reza. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. Um and I'm really happy to be the first speaker and probably the, the hardest one just to start this sh show. Uh, as a good producer, uh, the productivity of the herd will highly depends on the diet quality as well as what is actually present on the, on the pasture. So we may need to uh, have uh, an, um, an, a necessity just to supplementary feeding to the animals. So what would be the, the plan and what would be the best uh, management uh, for feeding supplements to the animals? So, um, <clears throat> I don't know why it's not just changing to the next one. Um, okay, yeah, good. So goats are actually browsing ruminants. They are sorting the diet. So when we are making uh, feeding recommendations for goats, uh, we, we need to just uh, consider that uh, those items. So um, they, they prefer, you know, the goats, they prefer to, to browse uh, from the shrubs and trees. So if actually there is limited resources for, uh, for the goats, 
then uh, uh, we need to consider some uh, supplementation for, for, for the animals. They naturally select uh, the diet actually for that they need, uh, that they need. I mean, just to get, give them adequate amount of nutrients. So if the goats are under intensive management, they may lose actually this ability. So then as a producer, we need to just give them some supplementation just to help animals to show their uh, genetic potential. A producer needs to provide some adequate nutrition to the goats um, just to help them to reach to the uh, genetic potential. Here are the five major nutrient requirements for the, for the goats, water, energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. So we know that the environment is going to be, uh, going to be changed and we need to be prepared for uh, feeding some supplements to, to the animals. So my goal is actually today is just to make you think about that. So which ones meet uh, the goal? Looking at these uh, photos here, um, there are some parameters that needs to be considered. Nutritional needs uh, changes through the, throughout the production cycle. So we need to identify what are the nutritional needs and we need to match them these, uh, the animal requirements to, to the nutritive values of the feed, to, to whatever that we provided to the animals. Using the body condition score is actually a good tool for as a fine tuned uh, nutrition program, just to, it will help a producer to see how is the, uh, the feed provided Good, is good or not for, for, the, for the goats. Here are some table of nutrient requirements, which we can find them easily in, on, in, on MLA website or on other books or whatever. So it gives us some indicators uh, for any breeds and any type of you know, goats that we are keeping or feeding. What do we need? What type of nutrients they require just to grow and produce milk or meat or whatever. <clears throat> so it is important actually to, to review the nutrient deficiency order. Uh, we need to target the, the primary limiting nutrient. It is, the, it is a priority. So priority for having actually a cost-effective uh, supplementation program. If you look at the, the left barrel, you, you can see that the first limiting nutrient is protein. So if we fix this, then we need to go and see what is the next one. So the next is actually the energy, which you can see on, on, the, on the right side. So it is really important just to know the order of the lim, uh, limited nutrients and, and uh, try to fix them step by step because we can actually fix all at once. So, the limiting nutrient will ch uh, will change depends on um, de depending on on the uh, on the circumstances because it, it would be you know uh, first of all it could be like protein and then when we fix this and when we have like a, in wet season we could have some uh, good gr growing plants so protein couldn't be actually the, the limited one. Any supplementation program, it must address actually the most limiting nutrient. And um, just to uh, have the, um, the supplement to be effective. So supplementation needs to be strategic as um, it, it needs actually just uh, to help animal uh, to, to show their per, uh, best performance. Even with the best pasture and grazing management, there might be some feed gaps and there might be some animal nutritional deficiencies. So there is a range of options actually for managing the nutritional deficiencies. Supplementation is a, pr a practical option. It can address actually nutritional deficiencies and it will help animal to reach the production targets. 
So the purpose of uh, supplementation is uh, to fill the gap between what is the uh, provided nutrient, uh, or sorry, between what is the required nutrient uh, for the animal and what is the nutrient supplied. So uh, it will just uh, help uh, us just to you know, fill this gap and have a balanced diet provided to the animals. Any supplementation program will look after a, a, a goat performance. So it could be weight gain, it could be lactation or even reproduction. So um, the goal here is just simply adding the nutrients to the like a forage based um, diet just to help animals to increase their productivity. So we need to just uh, see what is our goal, what we are looking for and which feed ingredients can help us to achieve this goal. Let's give you an example here. Animals who are um, on low phosphorus soil, they, they will respond to phosphorus supplements in wet season and not in dry season. It is because in the dry season, protein and energy are the primary limiting nutrients. So we need to fix this first and then go with uh, you know, fixing the, the lack of or a limited phosphorus availability. Let's look at uh, some um, responsible supplementation. Here is, as we can see, there is an excellent availability uh, uh, or enough or sufficient forage availability here. So there might be um, no necessary necessity for uh, supplementation, except uh, when animals um, need high amount of nutrient like late pregnancy or early to mid lactation. In the second one, we can see that there is a significant use of preferred browse species. So uh, as a strategy here, we can just use the pasture rotation or we can reduce the number of stock or stock size here. And in the last one, as you can see, it is a well-defined browse line on plants. So it, it shows overstocking and there is not enough uh, food for the uh, feed for the animals. And definitely there would be a, a supplementation uh, requ is required here. So how animals they are responding uh, to the supplements? There are two main factors. The first one is the animal factor. And the second one is the dietary factors. So when we are talking about the animals, we need to consider their physiological status. It could, the animal could be pregnant or lactating or growing. What is their age? What is the environment actually, the heat or the humidity of the environment? And what are the internal parasites? Uh, could it be a, a problem? Because if, even if we give them the supplement, animals may not actually show their genetic potential and they may not grow or produce well. So we need to consider this one as well. And for the dietary factors, uh, we need to think about the quality and the availability of the grazed pasture. What type of supplements and uh, we are providing and what are the nutrient balance in, that, uh, in those supplements? Here are actually different type of supplements available. So based on uh, our strategy, we can pick uh, any of those or we can pick a combination of those supplements. Let's see if we actually need just protein, we, we may just use urea or if we actually need high energy feeds, we can go with grains. And when some of those uh, protein meals like, uh, or protein stuff, um, ingredients like cottonseed or molasses or lupins. So any of those, they, they can provide some energy and also some um, protein as well. So um, we need to think about that and see what is our first priority and what is the second one? So if we are looking for energy first, so we need to go with the high energy. If we are looking for medium energy, so we can go with the brewer's grain or when we are actually needing just low energy feeds and we are looking more fiber, so we can just go with the straws. So the fiber supplementation, 
what is the importance of fiber supplementation in goats? It contributes significantly to the balance of the nutrients provided to the animals or required by, by the animals. It, it plays actually a major role in goat production through the, the influencing and interaction, interaction of uh, goat intake and digestion of the rumen, uh, digestion of nutrients in the rumen. In high producing dairy cow, uh, sorry, dairy uh, goats, dietary fiber is really important for keeping uh, the milk fat percentage or preventing from milk fat depression. So uh, we, we need to think about that. If we have a problem with milk fat or we have the milk fat depression, we need to think, okay, we need fiber for our dairy goats. So uh, this is uh, the, the, the main supplement that we need to look after that. This is the energy supplement. <laughs> One of the, uh, the common type of supplements is an uh, energy supplement. When uh, we are in late autumn or early winter, pastures in many parts of Australia, they are becoming ground and heavily dignified. So it means that more fiber is um, available and less uh, other nutrients. So uh, based on this um, situation, we need to have like a, a good management pasture and, uh, and then we, we may need just to provide some supplements to the animals just to help them uh, get their required nutrients. Um, energy supplements, uh, they, they, uh, they are commonly fed and specifically during the shortfall of pasture quality, they are really common. And um, it is actually a bit costly. So if we can, we need to just go with browsing first and you know, allow the goat to browse and get what uh, they can. And on top of that, give them some energy just to reduce the uh, feed cost. So when uh, goats have um, little access to the browsing material, so um, all they can get is just a dry mature pasture. So they may face um, you know, lack of space for feeding other uh, feed and also degradable nitrogen. So we need to think about this as a second priority. But the protein supplementation. Urea is not actually uh, supporting um, all of the required nitrogen or protein for young animals or poor lactation in those. It cannot cover or fix that problem. So we may need to give them some true protein supplement as well. It could be cottonseed meal, canola meal, soybean meal, or any other kind of true protein sources. So those pro uh, true protein uh, feeds, they can uh, um, actually play a, a good role in supplying some energy as well. So it is actually a, a, a good point that we can give, them, give animals some protein as well as some energy. So when uh, plenty of dry feed is uh, available, uh, urea is the cheapest available supplement. However, price is not the only factor that we need to consider because um, <clears throat> at the moment, the power shortage in China and also reported some shutdown to uh, cut the pollution, it affects the price of urea and also uh, to the availability of uh, that uh, in Australia. So uh, urea, using urea, it can um, uh, help animal to increase uh, their feed intake uh, by about uh, 30%. So um, we need to think about that. Okay, urea supplementation has a positive impact on increasing pasture intake, but there is a risk here because we cannot actually use um, too much uh, urea for uh, feeding to the uh, to the goats. Uh, it's so I, I'm maximum about 0.5 to uh, 0.5% of the dry matter of the uh, available dry matter to the goats. Here in um, Altec, 
we've got a, a product which is uh, OptiSync. OptiSync is a safe and traceable non-protein nitrogen like uh, urea. But it is a controlled release of uh, it is a controlled release technology. So it helps um, to release the nitrogen slowly in, in, in the rumen, and, and rumen microbes they can use it uh, gradually. Um, so we can just use this um, up to one point five percent of the dry matter, so it's safely without any problem. In this uh, graph here, you can see that. Uh, the red line is uh, the the optician, and the blue line is the normal urea. So when we feed urea, it, uh, we will have some surge. But when we give them some optician, it will slowly releases uh, or safely dripping uh, in the rumen. So the rumen bacteria can have access to to the nitrogen at any minute of the day. So it will help them to use this nitrogen more efficiently. You can see here in the role of supplement, uh, which is actually optising. Without optising, we can um, see on top is just the, the undigested feed material. While we are feeding them some optising, then we can have more digested feed materials. It, it is because it's uh, you know optising supports the rumen health and also it optimizes the nutrient intake and feed utilization. Animals, they can get better uh, daily weight gain and also their profitability will increase. The last supplement that I want to talk about is just the mineral supplements. We can see some table of uh, mineral required by, by the animals. So we can see animals, they need some macro minerals and some trace minerals. But just like humans, goat needs to take their required minerals and vitamins. And it needs to be offered to the animals free of choice. They can get access to that all the time. And uh, it is really important for the goats to uh, have, because those uh, minerals, they play um, an important role or as a, they are as a key component um, of, in the metabolic uh, processes, which will happen in their body. Uh, it could be uh, through a different um, way. Uh, one of the common way that we, people are offering minerals to the animals are loose leaves. So the loose mineral um, should be offered to the animals all the time to give the animals uh, the required minerals. So um, grains, uh, they, they have a um, low level of um, calcium and a high level of phosphorus. So when we are feeding some grain to the specifically, like let's say a winner um, goat, so we, uh, we and they may actually face with lack of um, or they can't get enough calcium. So we may need to just give them some some sort of uh, mineral supplementation. On the other hand, when we feed some cotton seed meal and whole cotton seed, it it has gospel, so it it can bind with uh, calcium and uh, animals can cannot get the required calcium. So we, we may need to uh, give them some uh, calcium um, in, in, case, in the form of um, mineral supplements. Molasses are also low, um, molasses is, uh, is low in phosphorus and high in calcium. So the combination of these two might be good. So if we are just giving um, you know grains, so we can give animals some molasses just to you know uh, give them some enough phosphorus and calcium. The other mineral that is really important is the zinc because zinc uh, plays a critical role in goats. It, it cannot be stored um, um, in in, um, in the body or or should say, literally is stored. And when animals, they have um, lack of or deficiency symptoms, they cannot uh, grow very well. They may lose their appetite. They may have poor hair growth or losing their hair. So we need to give them some kind of zinc supplement. It could be in case of an organic one or even like, uh, some kind of chelated mineral like bioplex zinc, which 
is um, more available and animals can get uh, and use this more efficiently. And as a, a take home message, when we are thinking about any kind of supplementation, before actually we start supplementing to the animals, we need to consider these four uh, different points. What sort of infra infrastructure is required? What sort of feeding frequency is needed? And what is the, um, the labor commitment in, in, in the farm? And also how this supplement is going to be stored and how it can be handled to the animals. So when we are uh, having some good answer for these um, questions, then we can just start supplementing um, to, the, to the goats. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Reza. That was a really great introduction to nutrition in general and, and also as nutrition and supplementation for goats specifically. So thanks very much for that overview and that insight. I'd just like to, before I introduce our second speaker today, just to remind everyone that you can ask your question in the question and answer chat function is part of this webinar and we can actually answer those at the end in the Q&A session. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A. If you just go down to the bottom of your screen, um, there's a little Q&A function and type your questions in there and we'll, we'll store them up to the end of the webinar and have a address them in our q and I'd just like to introduce our second speaker now. This is uh, Dr. Simon Feely. He's a research fellow in I'm a focuses on ruminant research uh, and production systems. And he'll share some insights from the recently completed MLA funded project, which is the response of rangeland goats to supplementation and the development of the least cost supplementation calculator. So if you have heard of our calculator that's readily available, I hope you put some questions in that Q&A for Simon because he's here and can't wait to answer your questions. So welcome, Simon. Thanks. Emma Patterson. So Emma is a, is a goat producer herself, um, sorry, um, coming from Queensland. She's got experience with supplementary feeding both um, goats from a depot to help rangeland goats reach market specification and more recently taking her supplementation skills into her stud breeding enterprise. I think Emma, if you're just sharing your screen, we might be having a few little tech issues, but um, yeah, Emma's going to give a bit of a, an insight into a producer's perspective on, on supplementation feeding. Is that screen working now? Yes, yeah, Excellent. it's all, all working for you, Emma. Um, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so thank you for the intro and it's always hard um, following um, people that are used to doing this all the time. So I'll probably sound like I'm garbling a lot, but I'll... Uh, I'll try and give you um, a good idea of what we do and what our journey with supplementing has been. Um, our background is that uh, we're originally from um, out near Yulo in southwest Queensland. We have a 40,000 acre property um, out there and um, mainly Mulga um, with a bit of flood country through it. Um, we have ran the goat depots at Yulo and Kanamala for a number of years um, before sort of depots phased out um, with the um, increase in uh, exclusion fencing and that sort of thing. Um, and my sort of first foray into supplementary feeding came um, about when I was involved with the project that was funded by MLA, which um, preceded Simon's um, project. And that was um, feeding um, the underweight goats from the depot to see if it was um, achievable to get them to um, a market weight in a um, profitable way. So that was um, way back in 2016. Um, 2017 was the first part of the trial where we were feeding pellets 
Um, and then the trial progressed into 2017, 2018, when we fed lupins. Um, we did see um, that the supplementary feeding um, did, uh, the goats that were supplementary fed had increased weight gains compared to the non-supplementary fed animals because we were um, we had a number of replicas. So we had sort of three paddocks that were not supplemented and three paddocks that were supplemented. Um, however, the trial was very badly um, affected by um, drought at the time. Um, when we started the project, it wasn't dry, but as we sort of moved through um, towards the end of 16 uh, and into 17, um, the country was getting very dry and we, I think the results of it were a little bit skewed by that, um, by that component. Um, we also um, had, we'd also noted the effects of winter stasis in that we um, saw that they weren't getting a lot of growth even with supplementation. And then because there was a, a six trial sites within the project, there were various other factors that um, affected uh, producers that were in the trial. Um, we had people down near Warwick that were quite badly affected by worms. Um, and then we had issues with landing grain prices, um, at, landing grain at a reasonable price um, and all sorts of things. So at the end of the, um, the trial, we so the outcome essentially was that supplementary feeding was profitable, providing the grain could get landed at a reasonable price, which at the time we determined was around four hundred dollars a ton or less. Um, interestingly, to note, um, so we were getting growth rates then of around um, with supplementation, we were getting growth rates of around one hundred and fifty grams per day. At the moment, out at Yulo, we're having a cracking season. And um, our growth rates without any supplementation at all are around the 200 grams per head per day on an average. We've got at the top of our mobs are doing 300 grams per head per day, and that's with nothing at all. So um, it would be really interesting to rerun these trials now with the way that the seasonal conditions are very favourable and just sort of be able to compare what's what. So towards the end of the, the trial um, period, uh, our business um, was changing a little bit. Um, you know, goat, anything to do with goats and business it rapidly evolves. So we were um, looking, we were retaining some of the goats from the depot um, as our own commercial herd. And we were trialling using um, boar bucks over those um, nannies out at Springvale to try and improve weight gains of the progeny for market, um, we were finding that anything that we bought that was a boar goat was not really surviving very well out at Springvale. They'd either get um, raped by the rangeland bucks or they would go and sit under a tree and they wouldn't work. So our um, business at the time tried to adapt to um, breed our own type of goat that was gonna add weight to progeny um, but also uh, be really adapted to those Western conditions. Um, a, a, at the same time, it was really dry out West. So we um, got onto some lease country for our cattle down near Kingaroy. Uh, we ended up um, moving uh, our family down this way because all of our livestock ended up down here, except for um, a couple of hundred head of commercial goats that we left out at Springvale. And it was a really good um, opportunity for us to sort of further develop this stud herd um, at the time. So our Kingaroy property consists of around 700 acres um, near Kingaroy. Uh, we run a fairly intensive operation on um, what were mainly lovegrass pastures. And if anyone knows lovegrass, it's a very low um, value feed. Um, but we're gradually improving it with um, bluegrass. And then we also um, have some water allocation, which allows us to grow forage crops. Our stud herd is currently at around 400 head and we will be growing that over the next year to around 600 head. Um, our aim is to have three kittings every two years with a, a greater than 150% weaning. And then we also use um, embryo transfer programs and, um, you know, uh, semen collecting, etc., to try and improve our genetic gain. <coughs> so um, back to the strategic 
uh, with back to the supplementing, and I say um, we use supplementing strategically to help um, improve our production. Um, you've already seen the um, diagram up in the um, right hand corner of the bucket overflowing and that when I, I went to a, some one presentation at one point and that's the image that sort of stuck with me all the time is that um, you know the, the limiting factor of what our nutrients are and for us um, they're mainly protein and energy it's mainly seasonally based over winter um, but then we also use supplementing strategically at key points um, within our production cycle such as joining um, maintaining our maiden preg tested in kid does um, when our um, kidded does are at peak milk and also um, as a transition at weaning for our kids. Um, what do we supplement? Um, so we started off supplementing with the pellet that we'd used in the um, MLA trial. Um, and I had to look for some different alternatives because the price of it just kept going up and up. Um, when it got to just under $700 a tonne, I um, found a different alternative. And I, I worked with a company in Toowoomba called Nutrition Service Associates, who also helped with our cattle nutrition. And they formulated um, a loose lick ration for us, which is load, made locally at one of the mills. When we first started feeding it um, about two years ago, it was at $430 a tonne, which I thought was great. I thought that was a really reasonable price. The latest pricing, because it gets repriced every month, it's now at four, $537 a tonne. Um, I still feel like it's uh, profitable at that price, but I haven't worked out what my upper limit is yet. Um, we have um, Adlib, Megamin, Graze and Grow 3% urea out in all of our paddocks. Um, and I also, I won, a, I won at a um, raffle up, a palette of lick blocks. So um, I got a combination of the two that you can see down the bottom, the U blocks and the goat blocks. Um, we have them out um, at, in the same location where we put, have our mega min in drums and the goats probably go through, I would say, I'd say I'm running a paddock of about 150 head. They'll probably go through two blocks a year. Um, the mega min um, loose lick, they do use it. Um, they don't smash it like cattle do or anything like that but I my theory is they're low cost inputs and the goats will go and use them if they need them um so the only trouble with it is when it rains and there's been a lot of that right lately we bring the um the loose lick in uh, and put it under cover um so does it work a million dollar question and we believe that it does um our Preg test rate has increased um, over the last uh, two years from 85% to 92%. Um, whether that's a direct result of nutrition or whether it's due to culling um, for reproduction, I'm not sure. Um, our, <coughs> pardon me, our kidding rate has um, seen quite a drastic improvement from 144% to 176%. Again, other factors there could be involved such as we like over the last two years, the seasonal conditions have improved. Um, you know, it was quite dry two years ago compared to now we're having a cracky season. Um, our weaning weight, our weaning rate has been relatively the same in that we drop about 10% from our kidding rate, but our 90 and 100 day um, weights, we have seen um, a good improvement on them. And I put that down well I put it partially down to the fact that we start creep feeding our kids in the lead up to weaning um, and then we um, keep them on a on that feed ration um, for about six weeks after weaning so I want to try and make sure that I don't have a backward step in um, the performance of my kids um, and I mean the whole thing I'm striving for is to improve the lifetime performance of my animal and I believe that um, performance begins at conception and so the um, first trimester of a pregnancy um, determines how the animal sort of will perform over their life the second trimester determines um, the size of the placenta and um, the kid weight at kidding and then the third trimester is going to determine um, how easily my doe gets back into kid and how well my kids do when they hit the ground. So 
I try and maintain my um, kidding does at around a fat score of three to three and a half percent. Um, I just, I don't, I don't um, routinely weigh them, but I do sort of visually assess them and they are in the yards quite often at the moment for getting wormed. But I also know, um, well, so going back, Simon made, it, made a good point that we don't have a lot of information about um, goats um, and measuring with blood sampling and that sort of thing. But I have been through the process with our cattle that are on similar country and we went through and we did the blood tests and we did fecal and IRS and we did pasture sampling. So I have a fairly good like overview. And if I can just translate it and go, what's this, what's for cattle is the same for goats. I know that this period now coming into winter, my pastures are starting to lose their um, oomph. I know that I'm a little bit selenium deficient. I know that I'm at phosphorus deficient at time times. So the whole goal with my supplementing um, mentality is that I'm just trying to maintain a constant um, body score condition of my goats throughout the year. And particularly in winter when there's a double whammy and that I know I've got winter stasis as well as my pasture condition dropping off, I want to just keep them on an even keel. And that's how I believe I'll achieve my three kiddings every two years. Um, so again, Simon said, um, oh, so how do we supplement? Um, we use so I use ad lib feed bins, which is really unusual for goats, um, but I can only use ad lib bins when my pasture is good. If, if once my pasture starts going off, the goats will just sit at the feed bins and guts themselves. Um, and, you know, that's not good for them or my pocket. Um, but I can very easily, when my pastures are good, stick a bin in, dump a ton in at a time, and they will pretty much be spot on for, you know, getting their couple hundred grams a day um, as they need it. Um, at times I will hand feed in troughs. So, um, when I, so I've got a bit of a gap now between I'm waiting for my winter forage pastures, um, to get going. Um, and I'm, my feed's starting to come off. So I'm at the point now where I'm going to start thinking about hand feeding, um, but I'll only be strategically feeding those animals that need it. So I've got a mob that's, um, in the middle of kidding. So they're sort of on my, the top of my list of the ones that will next get supplemented. Um, but I also don't necessarily always feed um, the, the loose feed to them. One of the things that I do use um, as a supplementary feed is big squares of vetch hay. Um, it's not common in Queensland, but I um, get truckloads up from down in Victoria and it goes, I feel like it's one of the best feeds that I can give goats. It's really high in protein and energy. Um, they seem to do better on it than they do on loosen. Um, I very naughtily dump the big squares in my paddock. I leave the strings on. I make it hard for them to, um, to sort of, you know, they've got to work to get a, a mouthful. They can't just sit there and guts it. Um, and the only issue I have is I just have a bit of a cover on it so they can't jump on the top of it and um, muck it up. And then, as I mentioned before, we do use creep feeders um, when our kids get to around... Um, two, two and a half months, sort of in the lead up to, um, you know, two weeks before weaning. Um, one thing I will say with, with our supplementing, we um, do make sure that we vaccinate. So um, we use a combination of six in one and three in one. Um, we do tend to find that we have um, issues with enterotoxemia if we are not keeping up to date with our vaccinations and also supplementary feeding. Um, and then what I was going to make a point about before is I made some notes. We have the same issues that Simon saw in his trial. We have, um, when we're at troughs, we have, you know, shy feeders. We have bullies that'll just hunt everyone away from a whole trough. So we probably use higher than what, you know, a recommendation for a sheep feedlot trough would be. Um, but yeah, they're, you know, anyone that's in goats knows that they're fairly unique creatures and not always like sheep. Um, and then, yeah, just to sum up some of the challenges that we're sort of looking at at the moment, um, I touched on the feed price. Um, we, we could make it cheaper ourselves by, um, you know, playing with some of our inputs. Um, you know, there's some, we're in peanut country, so there's some good peanut byproducts that we could use, um, which would be a lot cheaper. But I do have um, someone on my team that is um, allergic to peanuts, so that's a bit of a challenge. Um, and then, you know, we could 
scramble around and buy all our inputs for a lot cheaper dollars per tonne, but then you've got the labour of mixing it and, and the infrastructure to handle those um, bulk lots of grain. Um, one of our other challenges as we become bigger, it's becoming more of an intensive job, a, a job to feed them. Um, as my mob sizes get bigger, you know, the number of kilos that you're having to feed a day, a day starts to get to the point where um, we, it's too much to manhandle. So we have well, about 12 months ago, we started looking at more forage based solutions. So we've got um, a paddock planted to loosen trees. We've got another paddock that we've planted to um, a shrub called Pragardis desmanthus, which is that's what the picture up in the right hand corner is. Um, and then, yeah, we might also look at bringing in auto feeders um, at some point for um, when we're, you know, looking at creep feeding or weaning or um, those sorts of things. And that's it. Wonderful. Thanks, Emma. That was a really great insight into your experiences with um, supplementary feeding. Well, I think that was an, a wonderful series of, of three really great talks today for today's webinar on supplementation. I'm going to open the floor now to some questions. So. If everyone, if you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the, the question and answer um, chat of the webinar. I do realize it's already three o'clock, so, um, but we, we will hold this on for a little bit longer to, um, to address some of these questions. We do have some that have come through. The first question is how much does the supplementation approach differ depending on breed? I'm not sure if, if you want to start <clears throat> answering that one, Emma and, and Reza and Simon might be able to, to jump in as well. Um, I think the breed is a factor, but I think it's more just a conversion rate. Like we know that it, it's a bit like, um, you know, feeding different breeds of cattle. You know, some are going to have a better conversion rate than others. So, um, all animals, I believe, I mean, nutrition is fairly pivotal in the in a life cycle of an animal. So I think nutrition is worthwhile for any animal, but we we just know that it's going to be more effective feeding like, you know, a boar goat than a other than a rangeland goat. But it all depends on sort of what market you're going into as well, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Reza, Simon, did you have anything to add to that question? Um, no thanks. Yeah, just uh, Melanie really read over that, and yeah, but no more time. No worries. Well, we do have a, another question come, which has just come in, which says, "What do I do if I run several different breeds on farm?" I guess it's looking for some some supplementation advice on if you're running different breeds and different requirements. <coughs> um, I can just uh, answer to this question as a, uh, as a uh, practical you know, way. Uh, the, the best way, and the, uh, I would say that the practical way is just when you are uh, looking after different breeds, um, it is uh, possible just to multiply actually the number of each breed and then, uh, <clears throat> then you, you can find out, okay, how uh, uh, per, how much is the percentage of uh, the animal to breed A and how much is the breed B or C or whatever. So for each breed, you can just uh, calculate the required um, supplement. And then you can just have like a, uh, uh, an average of uh, different breeds. And then you can, you can consider uh, how much uh, supplement you need. Yeah, wonderful. I, it, it could be actually, sorry, it, it could be actually in, in, in a period of time, you know, let's say for a month or for, for a quarter. Yes, yeah, no, that makes sense. We've got another question that's um, that's just come through. Oh, Emma's just answered it. It was Miles on the, on the Q&A. He just mentioned when vaccinating, when feeding for some problems, what was it, thanks. And Emma just mentioned that she, they use the, the Glenvac six in one annually and the Glenvac three in one quarterly. Um, 
I guess just following on from that question, Emma, would you be able to provide some insight into some of those um, problems that you've seen from a from a health perspective with supplementing animals and, and ways that you might have overcome them? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so goats are fairly fickle um, <laughs> and feeding them does have some different challenges to say feeding cattle or sheep. Um, some of the key ones that we have learned are the vaccinating. So um, enterotoxemia has been an issue and that is, becomes more of an issue when you um, change diets. So if they're on part, and even if we um, have an intro period and we go bring them onto grain really steady, we still tend to find that we have issues unless we keep our vaccinating up to date. So Whereas um, being a stud herder, we probably take it to, to an extreme. So we do an annual booster of a six in one um, and we try and time that booster. Um, oh, how do we do it? Well, anyway, so we, we do an annual booster of six in one and then we do quarterly three in one boosters um, That's a, that we use Glanvac. Um, some of the, isu the other issues are with the way goats jump into things and onto things. And Simon would have seen this in his trial is, um, you know, they're climbing animals. So we use very, there was a picture of it in my presentation. Um, we use very low to the ground troughs. They're about 10 centimetres high and they've got um, an angled dip into the middle. So they don't naturally tend to stand in them as much and, and then don't defecate in them as much either. And then the other issue which I touched on is when we use the big squares of vetch, um, you know, jumping on top of them and, and urinating and defecating on them, we had to overcome that issue by putting a cover on them. And we've also got some hay feeders that are sort of raised up off the ground and have a bit of an angle to their bottom. Um, we have the normal issues with, oh, we don't have any issues with coccidia at the minute because everything, you know, is kept dry and clean. Um, but yeah, they're the main ones. And then, yeah, you'll end up with a few older does that are just proper bullies and, and they need to have their own sort of, you know, five metres of space that no one's allowed into. So just your usual um, bullies and shy feeders and um, those sorts of things. You know, I, I, at the start of it, I was sort of working on, you know, 60 centimetres or 30 centimetres of trough space per animal or something like that. And I think I've, I've had to increase it and it's, it is no more, it's no longer a sort of set measurement. It's just, if I can have enough troughs there that they're all feeding without anyone getting hunted away, then that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, it definitely makes sense. Thanks for that, Emma. We've had another one come through the, the Q and A and that is, what is the range in nutritional value of eucalyptus leaves in older trees versus after pulling country and the leaves are fresh? Reza, do you, do you have much insight into eucalyptus trees or Emma, have you had to, to deal with them either? Uh, I'm afraid not, but uh, uh, in uh, nutritional view, I would say that we would have uh, less um, soluble sugar and more fiber in, in the mature leaves. And uh, rather than that, yeah, when they are fresh, so animals, they can get more soluble carbohydrates available. I'd suggest going and speaking to a local agronomist. Um, the agro that I work with, he has a book and it has sort of like the average um, protein and energy requirements of all different types of um, pastures and forages. Um, and they might be able to give you some insight into it, um, but I don't know. It's not something we have up here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in. So I don't know either. It's a good question. Um, and, you know, the role of goats in regrowth uh, control on pulled country is um, probably something that's really interesting, I think. Um, but if, uh, if I can have some time to follow up, there's also um, a, a lot of work done probably back in the 70s and 80s looking at a few of these um, trees and tree feeding systems. So it may fall out there um, if I can have a bit of time to chase up on that one. It's a good question. Wonderful. And we've, we've got one for you here, Simon, which is what did you learn from your practical research on 
goat supplementation? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Another good question. And, and we, we had the complicating issue that we were putting them in a fairly artificial environment uh, in individual pens or in uh, group pens, right? Um, uh, Emma probably said everything I can say. They were fussy. Um, sometimes um, they would come on to some supplements that we tried very quickly. Others, of all the things, uh, loose and chaff was probably the hardest thing. Uh, it took them the longest to come on to it. Um, they were very good at sifting and sorting. So we were feeding rolled wheat and rolled sorghum uh, and they were able to sift that quite well. Um, we, we think there were probably some maximum um, levels of those high starch diets that we hit in a number of trials. We never actually achieved the highest level of intakes that we were targeting. Um, at, a, at a practical level, you know, uh, Emma mentioned the issues of bullying and, and they were real when we put them out in the group pens. Um, some, some goats never got a chance and you could try and pull out those <laughs> smaller, lighter goats that are being bullied, but then they're just gonna pick on another one, right? So uh, it's a real challenge how to manage that. Um, from, a, from a feeding point of view, the approach we took in the, the group pens and keeping in mind, we weren't supplementing at this point. We were, we were trying to, it was like a feedlot, if you like. We just made sure that there was always feed there. Um, we were less worried about trough space and more that there was always feed available for those shy feeders to get in or those bullies, they needed to go away and have a drink, ruminate and whatever there was always an opportunity for the little ones to get in there at some point. Um, hay feeding, we actually, we tried a few different methods. What we found best was um, uh, we were putting out 500 kg rectangles as well. And um, the advantage feeders with the roof on top was easy for us to put bales in and out of. We ended up putting a 100 by 100 mil square um, weld mesh attached to the outside. So that made them work hard. Um, they were still able to get their noses in and out. What we were worried about with the, the rails was that uh, they could still get in between the, the, the rails on those feeders. Um, we put the weld mesh on there uh, to stop that. We were, we were worried about them obviously contaminating the hay. Um, and also uh, animals getting in there and if uh, hay fell on them or, um, you know, they got hung up or whatever, we, we were very conscious of, of that. So that's why we put the world mesh on the outside and, and that worked well. Uh, Wonderful. I, I, think, I think in terms of timing of feeding, you know, at a practical level, it, it's not something under extensive conditions you want to be doing every day, right? Um, so probably twice a week or something like that is a a reasonable sort of um, balance of doing these things under extensive conditions. And I think the cattle guys um, putting out a, a, a dry season supplement, you know, that's probably a sort of reasonable target that they would have. I don't know if Emma might have a different opinion on that, but um, it just depends on, the, on where you are, the scale of your enterprise and how easy it is to get around your animals. That's why I've gone to the vet, Simon, is, is it meets my energy and protein requirements, but is a lot less, you know, you don't have to um, be there every day to feed or anything like that. And keeping the strings on the bales makes them sort of demolish it very slowly. So that's how I ended up at that as an alternative um, because yeah, it's not practical when I'm getting up to, you know, I want to get to 600 head this year and it's not practical. Even my mob sizes are not um, at a point where I can hand feed more than one mob. So yeah uh, it's a really good suggestion it's something we never thought about yeah all those auto feeders that's sort of why i'm considering that but then it, you know it's it's infrastructure investment and i've got i'll have issues with the trough space because i don't think i'll get one that's you know you just physically can't get one that's going to be long enough and yeah. cheap enough to make it worthwhile so yeah it, that's it's something that i ruminate on a lot <laughs> <laughs> good We've got one lucky last question for today and it's just come through the Q&A and it's a good one to, I think to, to wrap it up. 
but um, the question says, how does your nutrition, how good does your nutrition have to be to aim for two kiddings a year or is eight month kidding more manageable? I don't, I don't think two kiddings a year is achievable. Uh, I'm going for three kiddings every two years, which is an eight month. So, um, and I'm, I'm there. I um, just don't have my um, joining uh, my preg test percentage where I'd like it. But I think that's more a culling for reproduction issue. So um, my the mob that I've just finished joining and preg testing, um, they're on their third joining in two years, and they preg tested at eighty five percent. So I want to get that. Um, preg test over 90% before I say, yes, I'm successfully doing this. Um, but I think that's more, um, more a case of, uh, of, of culling for fertility. Um, and, but I, I wouldn't be able to achieve that without the, nu the supplementary nutrition that I'm doing, I don't feel. And yeah. I, I'll just jump in with a couple of random comments there. I think just don't forget the management side of things, you know, weaning your weaning your kids at the right time and getting them onto good quality feed um, is really important in these systems. So it's not just having the kidding rate, but also having the weaning rate and those weaners are doing well. And the other part that was just a dot point on Emma's slide, but I think it's really important and that's around lifetime productivity. And, um, you know, we might be able to achieve that, but how quickly do we burn them out, those does? Um, and to me, it comes back to, I guess I come from the cattle background, but hitting the critical mating weight for your um, um, young does, your maiden does, and setting them up for life early. Um, so don't get it, not getting them um, that first pregnancy too early. They'll take a long time to recover and, and those sorts of questions. So thinking about it in terms of, the productivity of the whole lifetime of the um, the breeding herd, not carrying unproductive females is what Emma was saying then. And then forward thinking about, you know, how this affects um, um, methane and stuff like that at a whole herd level, because there's a real focus on that, obviously, across the red meat industry at the moment as well. Wonderful. Okay, well, we might wrap up today's webinar. I'd just like to remind you all that um, in the chat function, this, the links have been sent through as well as the post webinar survey to fill out. And we would really appreciate everyone who's listened to today's webinar to fill out that, that survey. We'll also send out a recording and the links to everyone via email after the webinar. Thank you to our amazing speakers today. Um, I think they all gave you a really good insight into supplementation for goats. And also a big thank you to Hayley from Ag Communicators for hosting this and organising this webinar. If you do have any questions following on from the webinar, please reach out to either Hayley at events at Ag Communicators or myself, Melanie, um, which is msmith at mla.com.au. And we'll be happy to provide you with some more additional information. We have our next Goat Roadshow coming up, hopefully in June, which will be on genetics. So please stay tuned and, um, and sign up for that webinar when the, once the links come through. Thanks very much for today and thank you for attending. <laughs>